is the one thing all veterinarians should be doing right now to get them on the right financial path? Ah, that's a good one. <laughs> and so all veterinarians should really focus on... I'm Jamie O'Kane, CPA, small business advanced tax planning and compliance extraordinaire. And this is the Abundant Beans Podcast, the podcast that takes my love for learning what makes people tick while digging into the good, bad, and ugly of small business ownership. We strive to give you the insight that only those in the trenches of being and working with entrepreneurs can provide. Uh, today, I'd like to welcome to the podcast, Dr. Meredith Jones. Thank you for having an easy last name. Uh, Meredith is an emergency veterinarian in Richmond, Virginia area. In 2016, she completed training to become a financial coach and founded the Debt Free Vets podcast group. Oh, sorry, Facebook group. She is a co founder of Veterinary Financial Summit, a financial conference and online community for veterinary professionals. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, how did we meet? Did we meet on LinkedIn? I think so. I think that's where we met. Awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, and Meredith and um, Veterinary F uh, Financial Summit, that you guys have been doing some good panels for vets over this COVID-19 stuff. Um, so that was really fun. I got to be on the first panel. You guys have another one coming up in a week or two. Um, I'm sure by the time this goes out, that one will be done, but you might be on your third one. Um, mm -hmm. So we're excited. Those are fun. Um, and I can't wait to see the replay. Yeah, I can't, so we can't to see the replay on the next one. Um, so what was your first job? My very first job, I actually worked as a kennel attendant in a vet hospital. Uh, so it's not too unusual for <laughs> veterinarians to do that. Mm -hmm. And I actually, the, the first couple of days I was a volunteer and the second day they said, well, you know how to work. So we're going to offer you a job. <laughs> So awesome. I was 17. And then is that when you knew you wanted to be a veterinarian? Uh, well, I, I knew that around age 10. So I'm just one of those vets who pretty much always wanted to be a veterinarian. We uh, grew up with a lot of dogs and, and my parents bred toy poodles and oh, that's cute. got interested from a pretty early age. <laughs> And finding the more veterinarians or the people that work in the veterinary space that I talk to, like the more you all have been doing this since you were born or like you just knew what you wanted to be. I can't imagine people grow up being like, I want to be an accountant because I didn't know I wanted to be an accountant. Right. Um, but yeah, I don't know anybody that was like, I know, I know my kids are not like, I want to be an accountant when I grow up, mom and I would be like, what? You have no idea what that means. <laughs> um, so give us a quick overview of your background. Oh, Sure. So I grew up in the Raleigh, North Carolina area, and I actually went to undergrad and vet school in the same community um, where I grew up. And so I went to North Carolina State University, uh, graduated from vet school in 2008, and then I did an internship in Connecticut at uh, actually rotating between two VCA hospitals. Mm -hmm. And then after that, moved to Richmond, Virginia. Um, I got married right before vet school started. Oh, and so, <laughs> so that was that was an interesting experience. My husband likes to say that he didn't see me for five years oh. uh, <laughs> between vet school and internship. Um, so yeah, so I've been working as an emergency vet in Richmond for about 10 years now and actually at the same practice that's a emergency specialty practice uh, which is awesome. relatively unusual to be in the same practice that long for an emergency vet so uh, they have a we have a tendency to move around more <laughs> so. yeah um and that ER specialty is interesting um we took our, our dog a year ago um I was like, that was more than that. It was almost two, two years ago now. You know, we ended up in the ER and like the whole thing. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the ER vets were the best. Um, and that's why when somebody was like, well, you should focus on the veterinary space. And I was like, oh, yeah, they're cool. Um, <laughs> you know, they were just so, they were just so good to us and our dog. Oh. And, you know, um, you guys are special. You keep, you stay up at night and <laughs> <laughs> 
watch our dogs having seizures, uh, which is crazy to me. Um, so why did you decide to become a financial coach? Well, uh, after I graduated from vet school and then did my internship, I had this sudden realization that I was in a lot of debt. And uh, so for me, it was about, it was a little over a hundred thousand, about 120,000 in student debt. So I don't, I didn't have as much debt as a lot of the new grads do now. Um, but I, during the time that I was really focused on paying off my student debt, which was about a three and a half year time period, I just started to read everything that I could about personal finance and really developed a passion for it. And so, <clears throat> so I, then after I paid off my student debt, I decided that I wanted to help other people who were who felt lost um, with their finances like I did at one point and mm -hmm. so I decided to take a financial coaching course in 2016 and then and that was a that was a few months long as far as um, the the online portion and then there was a in-person uh, about three days so um, I took a course out in Tennessee and then we had some mentoring for a couple of months after that with some more experienced financial coaches. And so after that was when I decided to start the Debt Free Vets Facebook group because mm -hmm. there was a lot of talk. This was back in 2016 when they had the Fix the Debt Summit and there was just a lot of talk about how our profession was, was reaching a point where a lot of vets were in a bit of trouble as far as um, student debt being more of a problem with increasing tuition and um, and just uh, increasing debt to income ratios mm -hmm. in the profession. And so I decided to start the, the group because I was seeing all these articles where people were saying, oh, this is such a problem and you know, we should do something about it and mm -hmm. having that meeting where they said we should do something about it, um, but vets weren't really talking amongst themselves about personal finance at all. So the idea was to create this place where we could have those conversations. That's awesome. You just answered my next question. So you said you had a hundred to one hundred twenty thousand in debt after school. What are we looking at right now for current vets? Mm -hmm. Usually, what's the average? Well, the official average from the ABMA is around 160,000, but that is self-reported. And oh. so what I, what I mean when I point that out is mm -hmm. that the, the vet students are answering a survey in their fourth year of vet school and they're mm -hmm. saying, okay, this is how much debt I have. And some of them are just looking at how much they borrowed and not how much interest is about to capitalize on the loans as well. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other thing is that's, that's an average across the board. And so there were some students that their parents saved up and they were able to pay for all of their schooling or mm -hmm. a portion of that school and help them out that way. So I think that average, even though that's the, that's that's the number that we have to refer back to. Mm -hmm. I think it's skewed to some extent downward and the, the actual average may be higher, um, but it's difficult to actually nail down that number mm -hmm. because it's done based on self-reported surveys. And so it's, it's hard because we have people in the group that easily have over 200,000 in student debt Thanks. and depending on where they went to school, if they were out of state or if they're in one of the universities where it's a, a, a private university that just has higher tuition in general, they could easily have 300,000. If they went to a, a Caribbean vet school, they could easily have more than 400,000 in student debt. That's a Caribbean vet school. Mm -hmm. Oh, so there are, three Caribbean vet schools. So there's Ross University, St. George's, and St. Matthew's. And so there are a lot of U.S. students that go there to go to vet school. I did not know that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I could imagine that's a lot of debt after living there, right? Mm -hmm. 
Wow. Um, and what are we looking at for average salaries, average start, starting salaries for veterinarians? Mm -hmm. So it's now, it's now into the 80s, so it's 80-something thousand, um, and so it, it goes up just a little bit every year, whether it's 82,000 or, mm -hmm. uh, or 85,000 at this point, it, uh, it's somewhere in there, and so that's certainly, that's up from what it was 15 years ago, um, certainly. But it's still, if you're looking at debt to income ratios, and if you're looking at that, the, the debt that we have is in some cases very similar to what MDs have, but they have much higher salaries to work with to pay that debt back. Um, and they also are able to take advantage of programs uh, more often that we're not able to take advantage of as often, like the public service loan forgiveness uh, program. Um, many MDs are able to take advantage of that and very few DDMs are actually able to take advantage of, of that. Uh, so it's a, it's a big problem for us uh, just looking at the debt to income ratios and then the options that are available to the newer grads. Mm, that's really interesting. So, you know, it's probably not cut, really cut pace with cost of living on top of that, right? Because you have a lot of small practices that can't pay a whole lot that aren't very efficient and they're just paying associates mm -hmm. the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so there, there are definitely still, so when you ask about the average, mm -hmm. you know, there are definitely still practices and individual vets that are getting 60,000 out of school versus getting, you know, 80,000 or so. Uh, but then depending on where you live, if you're living in a higher cost of living area, then it could easily be 100,000. But then you're also, your, your apartment is going to cost more. <laughs> so, Wow. So, I mean, even at that higher, I mean, because I like to do math, even at that higher 100,000, if you could allocate your entire salary, you're looking at at least four or five years to pay everything off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and there are some people who are doing that. If they're if they're married, they're putting their entire salary. If their goal is to pay it off as soon as possible, mm -hmm. that's what a lot of people are actually doing. And of course, that's not an option for everyone. Yeah, I mean, only if you have a spouse that can make enough money to live on, right? <laughs> what about their debt? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yikes! Mm -hmm. Yikes! Uh, my kids are going to trade school. <laughs> <laughs> um, so talk to us a little bit more about the Debt Free Vets um, Facebook group um, and how are you helping other vets manage their debt um, mm -hmm. in there and, you know, what kind of, what is the community doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for the Debt Free Vets Facebook group, we have veterinarians and veterinary students only in the group and mm -hmm. so they are posting about really anything personal finance related um, and sometimes practice finance related. So they, they talk a lot about debt just because of the title of the group and the fact that it's such a hot button topic in our profession. Um, but then they're also posting about other things like budgeting and you know, I'll, I'll put up a post like, what are your money wins this month? And they'll say, oh, you know, I, I paid off my truck or you know, whatever. Uh, That's so. awesome. We have some fun things and some positive things that go on there as well, uh, but uh, really, it's a it's a peer support sort of community, mm -hmm. and um, and there are it's something that's really grown dramatically over the last year. Mm -hmm. uh, so the when we started in 2016, of course, it started started very slowly. As you do. And we, we built up and, um, and then over the past year, it's just exploded to where it's, it's grown three times what it was a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, we have at this point about 4,300 members. Wow, that's great. So what are some of the biggest financial issues um, you're finding in the vet space? Mm -hmm. I mean, other than obviously student loan debt. Yeah. So student debt is really a very big one. The big one. Yeah, that's the that's a big one. But we also have we have people who are interested in starting a new 
starting a practice mm -hmm. um, or buying into a practice and they have no idea where to start. And so certainly one thing that I'd like to see is more resources for those folks mm -hmm. out there so that they know, so that they have a framework of this is, this is where to start. So that's something that's certainly going to be a work in progress, but mm -hmm. I'd like to see that happen eventually where there's a way that, uh, that we could help those folks out and certainly involving people like you involving, uh, involving some of the financial experts that have really mm -hmm. focused on this space would be helpful. And then other things with practice owners, there's more competition and there's different competition out there mm -hmm. than what there used to be mm -hmm. because we have, we have spay neuter clinics that are taking some of the business that traditionally would have, uh, would have happened at, general practitioners. Uh, some people are saying, well, it's cheaper for me to go to the spay neuter clinic or mm -hmm. to a lower cost clinic to have most of the wellness care done or the spay and neuter done. Uh, so there's, there are sources of competition out there that are a little bit different from what it used mm -hmm. to be. And so that's another thing. And certainly the other things that will come up as far as questions go are really basic questions, uh, which are certainly important to ask, but a lot of people are not very informed on what are their options for uh, retirement and investing. And if their employer doesn't offer a 401k, what can they do? And mm -hmm. some people are, or some vets are not really aware that they can invest in and put money into retirement if their employer doesn't offer. Mm -hmm. 401k as an option. And so answering those questions that this really, certainly they don't come up in vet school, you know, um, <laughs> and we, most of us got very little financial or business education during vet school. And some vet schools are really taking more of an initiative to put that into the curriculum or at least make it available on an elective basis. Uh, some vet schools still have zero. Mm -hmm. and, so there's a lot of variation there. I talked to a lot of people from CSU, so I know that they're expanding their business part for the for the business for the for the vet space because they're really just they know what's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to so be associate for two or three years. <laughs> they're going to be like, okay, I'm ready. I'm going to start my own practice. Mm -hmm. um, and I was talking to somebody. They're like, you know, vets really are into entrepreneurs a lot of the time. You know, you guys are really good at like understanding your jobs and then understanding how you would do things better and like standard of care, but then expanding on standard or standard of care and knowing how you want to do things. So that's really, it's really interesting. I am finding that in this space, a lot of people really are, you know, a lot of vets really are either entrepreneurs up here or entrepreneurs. In fact, um, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of them are just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like, but you do, you know what you're doing on, you know, your trade end. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really interesting. And I know a lot of People are just like, well, we're just practitioners, right? But you're also like really good at implementing new things a lot of the time. So I think it's really interesting. Um, it's an interesting set of personalities in the mm -hmm. vet space. Um, but yeah, I, I see that entrepreneurial spark a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, for sure. And, and certainly vet school is so difficult to get through. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it really, it, it, if you can, if you can get through vet school, you can learn business. If you mm -hmm. can get through vet school, you can learn about finance. And so it's, it's something that none of that is rocket science. It's something that we can definitely figure out. And mm -hmm. uh, one thing about veterinarians in general is we're always, partly because we're, we're working with animals and a lot of things are modified from what what was used on people or mm -hmm. we're taking things from human medicine and then applying it to veterinary medicine all the time. Uh, so we're used to being innovative in that way. Yeah. And I mean, the challenge of vet school is, you know, starting a business probably seems less challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, uh, I think once we get out, we, we, uh, so, some of us get uh, set in set in our, our ways and forget but but yeah absolutely it's I love it 
you can tackle vet school, you can tackle business. Oh, that's awesome. So let's talk about the Veterinary Financial Summit. So just give us a little synopsis of what the summit is, when it is. Mm -hmm. So the Veterinary Financial Summit is going to be September 25th through 27th, and it is going to be virtual this year. Um, so the plan is next year when hopefully coronavirus is not as much of a problem mm -hmm. plan is to uh, have an in-person summit, but uh, for this year it's going to be online. And so we are going to have both personal finance talks and practice finance talks. And so personal finance like uh, student debt, retirement, investing, and then practice finance, practice management topics. And so anything from how to get started to exit strategies. I love so. it. It's so fun. It's so needed. It seems to be very needed. We talk about culture, we talk about building practices, but it's that finance piece. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true for most businesses because mm -hmm. it's the hard, it's not the, it's generally not the fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. That's what we hear more often than anything else as a mm -hmm. comment. This is something that's really needed in the profession. And uh, one of our goals, too, is to really make it engaging. And mm -hmm. so we're not going to have dry, boring speakers at our conference. We're going to have people who have a sense of humor and, um, and who are interested in interacting with the attendees. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to have various formats, even even with it being virtual. The plan is to have not just uh, not just lecture formats, but also uh, panel format, roundtable sort of formats, uh, that sort of thing, where we can and, and workshops as well, where we can really dive down into topics and get people's questions answered, and also have a good discussion and have the attendees get to know each other and have some accountability groups where they can set goals and, um, and come together even after the summit to talk about how they're doing with their financial goals. I love that. So, you know, so you kind of just kind of answer my, my next question, but you know, my, my question was always like, what am I going to walk away with? in a mm -hmm. conference, right? Um, so masterminds, so your plan is to, to be setting up those small group masterminds, which is awesome. Um, I think, you know, a lot of us walk away from conferences like, that was fun. I met some cool people, but when am I going to see them again? Yeah. So yeah. creating that mastermind feel, um, mm -hmm. you know, through the workshops and the round tables and all of that. And then also being like, okay, here's your group, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And that's, that's when it, that's what I think is going to be one of the most beneficial pieces of the conference because really at most conferences you go and afterward you, you hopefully you carry away some some pearls mm -hmm. um, and hopefully you use those in your life or in your practice but having a group to come back to and and be able to say okay well this is this is what I accomplish this month or mm -hmm. hey, oh, this is what I need help with. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's going to be really valuable and the online community can help with that as well. I love it. Um, I'm actually writing down some ideas for you. I'll talk afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what are some, you know, with the whole COVID-19 thing and like, you know, what are some of the biggest financial questions, you know, vets are having right now with the current situation? Like some, what are some of the big open questions? Mm -hmm. um, and how are you guys, you know, helping address that? I know you guys are doing the panels. Yeah. Um, but like, let's kind of talk about that because I think it's important, like in the times like this, mm -hmm. to really talk about like, okay, what are the things that we're really seeing surfacing? Because mm -hmm when we have a good economy and I'm putting that in quotes because obviously it wasn't that good. Um, yeah you know, those stuff just kind of sits at the bottom, but it's all kind of come up now. So just kind of have some questions about what you're seeing, what are some of the biggest financial challenges for veterinarians right now, and what are they, you know, what do they need to know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, there are some vets who certainly business is down, mm -hmm. um, and it depends on the practice, and it depends on their 
location. It depends on how old the practice is. There, there are a lot of variables, but there are certainly some practices that business is down right now. And so one question that's coming up is, one, how do I continue to take care of my employees mm-hmm. through this? And then the other question that's coming up is, okay, when we, when particular areas start to open up, uh, how do we recover from this? And mm-hmm. that's one of the things that we're, we want to help address with our panels is you know, how, how do we get to a point where we're thriving during the economic recovery? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm, I'm seeing a lot of questions coming from practice owners and coming from uh, practice managers about that. Mm-hmm. And certainly there are individual that's depending on which, which niche they're in. Um, some of them are mostly business as usual um, as far as associates go or some of the practices that are doing very well. Uh, but then there are some folks who we have a few folks in my Facebook group who um, who lost their jobs, they were laid off because they were doing spay and neuter and it was considered to be a Mm non-essential. And so we do have some folks that are are having a difficult time with that. And then uh, I also am hearing on Facebook, I'm hearing from some vets and some of these are anonymous posts that are on other groups where they're they're working in meatpacking plants and they're struggling right now with having to continue to work in conditions where uh, COVID is, is actually spreading amongst their staff Thanks. members. And so that's something that's kind of scary, but, but bringing it back to the, the more common questions are really mm-hmm. how, to, how do we recover from this? And the other things that are coming up are, what do we want to take from, from what we're doing now what are the positives that we want to take and actually incorporate into the business? So depending on your state, and that's really important to say, depending on your state, some states were able to to practice telemedicine to varying extents. And so people are talking about making that a more permanent part of some of the practices. And they are also talking about just, right now the reality is that most of us are not, really interacting with clients in person that much. We're talking to them on the phone, Mm -hmm. they're sitting in the parking lot or they drop their animal off for the day. That sort of thing is happening. And some people like it, meaning some, some staff members, some doctors, some clients like that service better. And so if you say, okay, well, what, what can we take from that? Uh, can, we, can we actually offer that as a service more often where you're not necessarily coming in in person if you have small children or if you have a more flexible schedule? Could you uh, drop off your pet in the morning and get on the phone with the vet when they're available and they say, okay, this is, um, this is what we recommend for Fluffy today? Um, and so we're, we're opening up potentially potentially various business options and various types of appointment options that nobody ever really thought about before. Yeah. I mean, we know some people were doing telemedicine, right? But that was like a small portion, right? And now we're looking at this huge adoption of it really Mm -hmm. quick. You know, like all the early adopters were like, we've been telling you guys. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, And so, you know, what I hope most businesses are doing right now, um, and I keep saying this, but what I hope most businesses are doing right now is looking at their operations, mm-hmm. looking at how they've had to change them, mm-hmm. deciding if that's how they want to move forward. Like, what are we doing now that actually creates a more sustainable business for us long term? You know, like I do Zoom calls with all our clients. Some of our clients are literally down the street and we do Zoom calls because mm-hmm. the driving is literally like, it's like you get to do more time at work if you're not coming to my office. Right. You know, like that gives you at least 30 more minutes of production time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it gives, it gives everybody different options, but also we can still do face to face. That's the cool part. You know, you can still do like, we have the technology to do face to face with everybody at this mm-hmm. point all around the world, which is fun. 
Um, is- I don't know. I find it fun because I love like coffees and talking to people and seeing their faces and all of that. Mm-hmm. I do that. Um, and it's not totally the same as being in person. I'm a hugger. So mm-hmm. that's a thing for me. But yeah, like the sustainability piece you know, and the utilization of their nurses, you know, because they, when you're bringing on whole, you know, this new stuff, you have really have to utilize everybody in the practice, right? People have to go get the pets out of the cars. You know, you're really, you're really deciding what, you know, what services you provide here Mm -hmm. and deciding, Hey, we really do like this or we don't or whatever. Um, It's made people kind of try stuff. They weren't, they were like, maybe we will at some point. Mm -hmm. which is cool. I think it's really cool. And like mail order pharmacy. Um, I actually have a startup that opens tomorrow. I think there are, well, they think they were supposed to open yesterday, but they construction issues. So I think they're opening tomorrow, but they've already got their online pharmacy running. She's got her online dog food running, like everything's, you know, she's already got all this stuff going on because she had time to set it up. But on top of that, she was like, this is how I bring in revenue right now. I was like, it's set up now. Now you don't have to think about it and it's good to go. So it's really nice. It's been a, it's been a good time. I think it's been hard for everybody, mm-hmm. but also it's been a good time to be like, what about, you know, how does I business run? How do we change things? How do we make it more sustainable? Uh, it's really fun. And yeah. I also think it's hard, right? Mm-hmm. Um, like you said, there's associates apparently working in meatpacking factories. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, but now they know they don't want to do that ever again. <laughs> Right. Yeah. When this is over, yeah, they may be looking for another job. Oh, crazy. Um, all right. So before I ask my last question, uh, what is the easiest way for people to find you? So our website is vetfinancialsummit.com. And so you can check us out there. We've got a weekly blog and an email list. And then of course we've got the online community that's already open and the uh, summit that is coming up in September. We're excited. We're so excited. Um, So final question, what is the one thing all veterinarians should be doing right now to get them on the right financial path? That's a good one. (laughs) And so all veterinarians should really focus on educating themselves. And so uh, there's, there's no one person, there's no one resource that's going to have all the information that you're ever going to need. And so it's really important to educate yourself on both personal finance and practice finance. And I I say practice finance applying to everyone, not just practice owners. Uh, Associates need to know a lot about practice finance as well um, in order to be successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so certainly taking a look at your personal finances and figuring out um, how to prioritize things. So if if you have consumer debt, figuring out a plan to get that paid off. Um, Student debt, certainly there are different ways of approaching it, whether you're paying it off or whether you're going with the income-driven repayment plans. Every vet should have an emergency fund. And so that's really important. Um, And then just continuing to learn as much as you can about investing retirement. And um, that's the sort of thing we're helping with. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. You're welcome. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening or watching. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube, iTunes, or wherever you prefer to listen. If you learned something and found some useful information to apply to your business today, please consider giving us a thumbs up and a review. Until next week, be abundant.